Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Psalms, Psalm 105. The book of Psalms is a book of songs, and each song is individual that was not written all at one time. Psalm 105 will investigate a little bit more about its context, when it was written, what it means, what it's talking about. But I want to draw your attention to one verse. The reason I'm drawing you only to one verse first is because I've found, and I'm sure you've found the same, that many times in Scripture, there are passages of Scripture that as we read, we have an understanding of what it means because of some, you know, something we've been told or, or some assumption we've made. And we cannot see what is actually meant by that passage of Scripture because of an assumption that we're making about that about one verse, usually, or one phrase in one verse. And I've found that this is so troubling and so common in Scripture that I want to bring several sermons over the next month or so on passages like this, passages where you'll read something and assume that it means one thing and then interpret the entire passage in light of that assumption and then find um, if you actually study in, in, a, in, a, in a fair manner, in the context of what's being said, find that it means nothing like what you thought it, was, what, what you thought it meant. And that's not to say that whatever you thought was necessarily wrong um, as far as it wasn't a true thing. It just wasn't taught by that passage. This happens all the time. We'll talk about several of those passages, as I've said, over the next several weeks. Um, but I want to draw your attention to this one verse in Psalm 105. This verse, I think, acts for many people as a curtain that covers the rest of the passage. So that they've, for for many people, or at least I could speak for myself, for many years, I was never able to understand the rest of the passage because I had an assumption about what this verse means. Verse 15 says this, saying, touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. I heard Uh, a man that you've probably never heard of uh, named Benny Hinn who was preaching on this phrase and uh, and his his conclusion was that this means that a Christian person should never criticize a a person who is in spiritual leadership a, a pastor or some leader of the church even if they even if they do wrong they should never be criticized God will take care of them, even if they're doing wrong, they should, you should never criticize them. Which begs the question, how is God going to take care of them? Right? Is he not going to use his people to take care of them? Um, but he will, you know, the, the argument goes that we should go to, you know, David wrote Psalm 105, and, and David also said in, in 1 Samuel 24, and really in 26, in 20, chapter 24 of 1 Samuel, David is found in a, in a cave. He's on the run from Saul. Saul was anointed to be the king of Israel, and then David was anointed to take his place. But David hasn't taken his place yet. Saul's still the king. And Saul, jealous of David, is chasing him through the wilderness trying to kill him. David is hiding, and he's hiding in a cave. And while Saul seeks to kill David, uh, he stops for a moment to relieve himself in a cave. (laughs) The same cave that, unbeknownst to Saul, David is hiding in. David creeps up uh, behind Saul and has the chance to kill him and chooses not to. And later, he has another opportunity in 1 Samuel 26. Uh, David and his um, companion Abishai sneak into the camp of Saul, and God has, has made a supernatural sleep to fall upon all of the people in the, in the camp of Saul. Um, and so David and Abishai are able to sneak right in to Saul's tent. I suppose it's a tent. It's not, never said to be a tent, but where Saul is sleeping. And uh, Abishai says to David, let's kill him. Here's our chance. And David says, don't do that. Don't you think that God will not hold him guiltless who reaches out against his anointed. And uh, instead he grabs a, a, the cruise of water and the spear of Saul and takes them and later is going to present them to Saul in front of his, his people to say, listen, I'm not out here to kill you. Please stop chasing me. 
And uh, so, uh, you know, people who, who look at Psalm 105, verse 15, they say, here it says, touch not mine anointed. And David said it, it wouldn't, you know, that God would not hold him guiltless who reaches out his hand against his anointed. Doesn't this mean that even when someone is evil like Saul, if they're a leader of God's people, if they've been chosen by God to lead his people, that you should never, ever criticize them? To which I say, no, of course not. <laughs> I mean, think about it just for a second. Nobody's suggesting that we should kill people who are in leadership who are doing wrong, which is what Abishai wanted to do to Saul. And also, it's kind of silly to even say that a pastor or a leader of a church is the same as a, a leader of a nation. Um, so those are completely different things. And besides that, David didn't have a problem with criticizing Saul. He was going to take the spear and then go to Saul in front of all of his army and say, listen, I could have killed you and I didn't. You're doing wrong by chasing me down. So David didn't have a problem with criticizing Saul. He had a problem with killing Saul, with, with, with slaying him in his sleep. This was the problem that David had. Um, he didn't have a problem with criticizing. So this is not obviously a, a fair argument to be made, but but pastors and preachers who are interested in what I would call spiritual abuse, meaning they want to force people into subjection and shut their mouths at any sort of question or, or concern they might have about the actions of that, of that pastor, if you can call him a pastor, um, will often use this passage here to say, see, you are not to touch God's anointed and his prophets. You're not supposed to criticize Anyone in leadership in, in God's, of God's people. But, of course, in, in Hebrews, uh, you know, we're told, yes, to obey those that have the rule over us, for they watch for our souls. Meaning, those who are spiritually leading us, we should absolutely submit and follow those people. However, Paul makes sure to write in 1 Timothy that uh, you should not receive an accusation against an elder except unless you have two or three witnesses. Meaning, yeah, we don't just assume wrong things because someone said something about a, a spiritual leader. But if you can verify it, meaning if you have at least two witnesses, you absolutely accept it. And, uh, and, and actually, at 1 Timothy chapter 5, I'll read the very next verse because the very next verse is very important. Um, 1 Timothy, I hadn't planned to turn there, but while we're, while we're on the subject... I never know where these sermons will go exactly. Um, but 1 Timothy chapter 5. <clears throat> um, and uh, verse 17, it says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. That means receive the accusation if you can verify it. Them that sin, rebuke before all. What is he talking about? Elders that sin. That's pastors, leaders in the church who sin, rebuke them before everybody. Like, if they've sinned and they are a public figure in the church, they should be publicly rebuked. They should be publicly criticized. So, Clearly, there's a misunderstanding then about Psalm 105, and this becomes very obvious when we just read all of Psalm 105, instead of just reading one verse. So, we're going to now dive into Psalm 105 and see what the actual truth is, because here's the thing. This curtain that people who would like to abuse others spiritually um, have used um, for, to, to sort of vaunt their authority over others... This curtain has actually blocked many people from actually seeing and benefiting from the actual message of Psalm 105, which is powerful and amazing and has nothing to do with whether or not you should criticize your pastor. All right, now, I would love it if you didn't criticize me, but not if I'm doing wrong. Please criticize me if I'm doing wrong, if I'm sinning, or if I'm teaching false doctrine. I need to be publicly rebuked. And that goes for every pastor, every spiritual leader who's on a public platform needs to be publicly rebuked if they are doing wrong. This, is, uh, uh, this takes some wisdom. Of course, there's some things that are minor things. You know, they said something that offended you. That may not be something to come up and publicly rebuke for, but 
but a serious error, a serious sin, a doctrinal error that, of course, needs to be called out publicly. There's, this is important. Let's read what Psalm 105 is actually about, beginning in verse 1. Because you cannot start in verse 15 and assume you understand what verse 15 means. Verse 1 says this, O give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing unto him, sing psalms unto him. Talk ye of his wondrous works, glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord, seek the Lord and his strength, seek his face forevermore. Remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O ye seed of Abraham, his servants, ye children of Jacob, his chosen. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded for a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac, and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying, Unto thee will I give the land of Canaan and the lot of your inheritance. When they were very, but a, a few men in number, yea, very few, and strangers in it, when they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another people, he suffered no man to do them wrong, yea, he reproved kings for their sake, saying, Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land. He brake the whole staff of bread. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, who, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron until the time that his word came. The word of the Lord tried him. The king sent and loosed him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of his substance to bind his princes at his pleasure and to teach his senators wisdom." Israel also came into Egypt, and Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham, and he increased his people greatly and made them stronger than their enemies. He turned their hearts to hate his people, to deal subtly with his servants. He sent Moses his servant and Aaron whom he had chosen. They showed his signs among them and wonders in the land of Ham. He sent darkness and made it dark, and they rebelled not against his word. And he turned their waters into blood and show, slew their fish and their land brought forth frogs in abundance in the chambers of their kings. He spake, and there came diverse sorts of flies and lice in their coasts. He gave them hail for rain and flaming fire in their land. He smote their vines also, their fig trees, and brake the trees of their coasts. He spake, and the locusts came, and caterpillars, and, the, and without number, and did eat up all the herbs in their land, and devoured the fruit of their ground. He smote also all the firstborn in their land, the chief of all their strength. He brought them forth also with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble person among their tribes. Egypt was glad when they departed, for the fear of them fell upon them. He spread a cloud for a covering and a fire to give light in the night. The people asked, and he brought quail and satisfied them with the bread of heaven. He opened the rock, and the waters gushed out. They ran into dry places like a river, for he remembered his holy promise and Abraham his servant." And he brought forth his people with joy and his chosen with gladness and gave them the lands of the heathen and they inhabited and they inherited the labor of the people that they might observe his statutes and keep his law. Praise ye the Lord. You can tell that this psalm is about God's blessings and his work in the people of Israel. As a matter of fact, it's interesting that this psalm is repeated, not all of it actually, but some of it in 1 Chronicles chapter 16. In First Chronicles 16, we read of David, the, the event when David brought the Ark of the Covenant back into the city of Jerusalem. And when he did this, he wrote a specific song. As a matter of fact, it looks like what he did is he took three songs that he had already written, and he pieced them together to make a medley of sorts for this special occasion. And you'll see this in 1 Chronicles 16. It says, verse 7, Then on that day David delivered first the psalm to thank the Lord into the hand of Asaph and his brethren. And he goes on from verses 8 to 22 to quote Psalm 105, but only until verse 15 of Psalm 105. And in verse 22 of 1 Chronicles 16, it says, Saying, Touch not mine anointed, do my prophets 
no harm. This is where David ended his medley, including Psalm 105, and moved on to Psalm 96. In verse 23 of First Chronicles 16, we begin a part of Psalm 96. Sing unto the Lord all the earth, show forth from day to day his salvation. And that Psalm 96 goes from verse 23 of 1 Chronicles 16 until verse 33. And then in verse 34, 35, and 36, David concludes his medley by bringing in two, three verses from Psalm 106. Both the beginning and the ending of Psalm 106 are found in verse 34, 35, and 36 of 1 Chronicles 16. What David did is he put together a medley of songs about God and about the Lord uh, to remember this special occasion bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to the city of Jerusalem. Excuse me, I say back, is brought back to the tabernacle, but the tabernacle has been moved now for the first time to the city of Jerusalem, and this is the first time that the Ark of the Covenant has entered into Jerusalem. The idea is that the Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God and the presence of God is now going to dwell in Jerusalem. Interestingly enough, this is not just a present thing, but a future thing. Because when Jesus returns one day, he's going to set up his kingdom from Jerusalem. And God himself shall reign on the earth from Jerusalem. But, he be, but in, in a sense, the first time that God, in, in, a, in, a, in a governmental sense, entered into Jerusalem would have been when David brought the Ark of the Covenant into the city of Jerusalem. Of course, God is everywhere, and he's in control of all things. We understand those that. But in, in a more governmental, ruling sort of a sense, David is saying God is ruling. And in this, this special occasion, he wants to call the people to remembrance of what God has done already in their nation. How he has brought them to this place. He's talking here about the blessings of God and how God has guided them and blessed them. And what I think is really interesting about this, even though David in this instance, in 1 Chronicles 16, did not use the entire psalm, he put together a medley of songs. Psalm 105 does refer to much more, um, you know, many more occasions than what, what David included in that medley in 1 Chronicles 16. In Psalm 105, we have talk about Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, and Jacob, and how God is uh, how God you know orchestrated their lives in this this early period before the the twelve tribes of Israel emerged from the land of Canaan, and then he, he the last half of the psalm deals with Moses and the bringing of them out of of Egypt to, to the land of Canaan. And, and the, the ten plagues and all of this stuff. But what's very interesting, I think, to note, while we deal with this first point, that's the blessings of God that we're seeing in this psalm, is that, is that the blessings of God don't always seem like blessings. They, they don't always seem like positive things. Uh, look at some of the things that are mentioned here as blessings. It says, um, verse number 18, it says, uh, when Joseph was in Egypt... Uh, it says, verse 18, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron. Matter of fact, in verse 25, speaking about how when Jacob brought his sons and his families into Egypt and they became a great nation, verse 25, it says, he, that, be, that meaning God, turned their heart, meaning the Egyptian's heart, to hate his people. Well, see, that doesn't sound like a blessing to me, God. You turning others' people to hate me isn't what I was praying for, Right? That's not the blessing I wanted. But yet this is how God worked in his people. And you, we have to understand a thing about the blessings of God. And that is that God's blessings are not for us. God's blessings are not so that we have a comfortable, pleasant life. If they were all about just our maximum comfort then we would just die and go to heaven because that's where we're going to have maximum comfort, right? That's not his purpose right now. That's in the future. That's coming, okay? That's coming. Amen. But right now, God's blessings aren't for us. Now, many times they result in wonderful things for us. But sometimes we have the temptation of thinking, I get money, that's a blessing. I lose money, that's not a blessing, right? Right? I, I get something I want, you know, I, 
I, I, somebody, somebody likes me or, or is favorable towards me, that's a blessing. People hate me, that's a curse, right? That's not a blessing. But, but rather, here in this psalm, it says that we should be, praise God for all of his wondrous works, all of his marvelous works, and some of those works were not comfortable. Some of those works were not fun. Some of those works were downright, didn't seem like a blessing. But they were blessings. They were all God's working. So we move then from God's blessing to the purpose for his blessing. His purpose, which is to fulfill his promises. He's, he's, he's got a purpose that he's accomplishing. And everything in your life, whether it feels good or it feels bad, is really good because it's accomplishing God's purpose, see. And this is why we have trouble, because we have a purpose too. You know, I have a purpose, you know. I, I've got this whole plan for my life, and I, I know how much money I need to do this, and I know, you know, and I've got this whole purpose set up, and sometimes God's purpose is different than mine. And that doesn't feel very good when God contradicts my purpose, right? But you see, God's blessings aren't for your purpose. God's blessings are for his purpose. He's accomplishing his work, and this, now that we've gotten to this point, we can enter verse 15. Because what exactly is verse 15 speaking about? Look at what it says in the verses right before that. We'll start in verse 8. He remembered his covenant. Remember, that's his purpose. He's made a promise with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And remember, that promise is that he's going to make of them a great nation, and that through that nation, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed, which is, a, which, is, which is really meaning that the Messiah is going to come through that nation, right? Um, that the Messiah that was already promised back in Genesis 3, that you know, there would be some who came, someone who came to bruise the head of the serpent. Now, that person, that, that Messiah, is going to come through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because God is going to make of them a great nation, and through them all nations of the earth will be blessed. So, it says here, this is what he's accomplishing. When he moves the Egyptians to hate Israel, it's because he needed them out. He didn't want them to be Egyptians. He wanted them to be a great nation, as he promised. He had a purpose, see? When, when Joseph was there, and he was hurt, he was in chains, and he was hurt with iron, this was so that he, could, he, he would be in the right place at the right time, so that he could become a ruler in Egypt, and uh, this would allow the, the Jews, when they came to Egypt, to be very wealthy, to become all everything they need to be a great nation, and then they just needed to leave, right? And so you see how God was working all of these things. He was making his promises take place. Verse 8, he remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham, and his oath unto Isaac, meaning Ishmael's out, right? Abraham's other son. He made the covenant with Abraham, and he confirmed it to Isaac, meaning it's going through the line from Abraham to Isaac. Verse 10, and confirmed the same unto Jacob, meaning it's not, you know, Isaac had Jacob and Esau. Esau's out. It's Jacob, right? Um, he confirmed unto Jacob, and for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. Now, Israel is the name of Jacob. Jacob's name gets changed to Israel, but also represents the whole nation, right? So, in a sense, He's confirming a covenant with Jacob and to Israel, meaning when he confirms the covenant with Jacob, he's confirming the covenant with Jacob's whole seed, right? His 12 sons and everything. Verse 11, say, saying unto thee, I will give the land of Canaan the lot of your inheritance. When they were but very few men in number, uh, yea, very few, but a few men in number, yea, very few, and strangers in it, when they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another, he suffered no man to do them wrong, yea, he reproved kings for their sakes. Now this is, he's given an overview. He's saying how God worked with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right? Now um, he's going to talk about Abraham and Isaac in this section. And there's one thing that Abraham and Isaac both did. And it actually happens three times in Scripture. Twice Abraham did it, and once Isaac did it. And that is, when they're traveling around, and they go to, the, you know, there's very few of them. Abraham, it's just Abraham and Sarah, and, you know, their servants and companions that are with them. But of the nation of Israel, it's Abraham and Sarah. That's it. That's a whole nation of Israel at the time. If you want to call it a nation of Israel, it's not a nation yet, right? 
And so there's very few in number. Abraham is concerned about the wickedness of the people around him. And as he goes from kingdom to kingdom, what he does is he tells the people around that Sarah is his sister, which isn't exactly false. She's actually a half-sister to Abraham. So th by this, he hopes to preserve his life. People won't kill him in order to steal Sarah. But on two occasions when he says this, um, Sarah is taken and almost is married um, or, you know, something happens there. And um, God has to step in and rebuke these kings. We see this in a couple different places. But let's go to Genesis chapter 20, which I think is specifically the most obvious place that's being referred to. Isaac also does this um, in Genesis chapter 26, and you can find the first time that Abraham is said to have done this in Genesis chapter 12. But in Genesis 20, we see the second time that Abraham has done this. This is a mistake, by the way. This is wrong. This is not trusting in God, and it almost results in ruining the plan of God. In Genesis chapter 20, we'll start in verse... Um, Uh, verse 2, And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken, for, she, for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her and said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister, and she even herself said he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. You see, if Abimelech had touched Sarah, it could have been said by people that when Sarah had Isaac, that it wasn't from Abraham. Oh, Sarah wasn't faithful to Abraham. Who knows who is the father of that child? And this would pervert the entire promise of God. No, Sarah had to be only with Abraham. It had to be a, there had to be a, 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 an exclusivity there. <laughs> Um, or else the promises of God would have been called into question. God's promise was that through Abraham and Sarah would come a, a, a son who would become a great nation, Isaac. And so God shows up when Abraham, the leader of the people, because it's Abraham and Sarah at the time, makes a wrong decision and does what is wrong, God steps in and preserves his promise and says, don't touch my anointed, referring to Sarah. When, when David is writing this, he says, when he says that the kings, he reproved kings for their sake, saying, touch not my anointed. David is referring to when God told Abimelech not to touch Sarah. Notice that Sarah is not the leader, right? It wasn't that, you know, this has nothing to do with criticizing a leader. This has to do with when leaders make bad decisions like Abraham, God still makes his promises sure and protects his people. He protected Sarah because of the bad decision, mistake, and sin of Abraham. He stepped in and preserved his promise. Listen, things go wrong People do wrong things, right? This seems like, like elementary language, right? Bad things happen. Right? Very simple verse, um, uh, sentences I'm giving you here. But, uh, but the, you know, this, this should be something we accept. But there are many who will teach, no, listen, if something bad happens, it's because you're out of favor with God. It's because, uh, it's because there's a demon that you've allowed into your life, and you just got to cast out that demon. You got to believe in God enough so that nothing bad ever happens. No, no, no. God prevents his promises from being destroyed. His promises are going to happen. You know, we have a promise that Jesus is returning. We have a promise that there is going to be a kingdom on this earth. Jesus is going to reign from Jerusalem. We know these things are going to, this is going to happen. 
And God is going to make sure it happens. But bad things are, as, are uncomfortable situations, mistakes, sins that we commit. Those things happen. The point here is that God's promises never fail. And so this passage, Psalm 105, tells us that God is at work. He's blessing, but he's at work for a purpose to accomplish his, his promises. That's his purpose. To bring about his plan f- for the ages. It's not about individual's comfort or an individual thing, right? But he goes on. Verse, uh, Psalm 105, we'll continue. Verse 16 through 22 talks about Joseph, who also had uh, many difficulties, but God was working his plan. Verse 23, Israel came also into Egypt, meaning Jacob. He, he moved to Egypt. Then Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham, and he increased his people greatly and made them stronger than their enemies. He turned their heart to hate his people, to deal subtly with his servants. And then he sends Moses, his servant, and Aaron, whom he had chosen. And it goes through the ten, the, the, the ten plagues, really, and, and reminds the people how God brought them out of Egypt. And then we find this in verse 42. And this is the conclusion. That's, what am I to do about all of this? For, verse 42. For he, he remembered his holy promise and Abraham his servant. And he brought forth his people with joy and his chosen with gladness. Remember, the word anointed means chosen, right? That's, that's what it means. Um, when it says that he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, touch not mine anointed, what, what David is doing is he's drawing on that, that, that phrase that was used for, for uh, not touching Sarah, and he's showing that it's through Sarah that God was really protecting the entire nation. I mean, he was not just saying, don't touch Sarah. He was saying, don't touch my whole, all of my people, right? You know, let, let my people, you know, accomplish my promises and my commands and, and my things. So he was protecting, through Sarah, protecting Sarah, he was protecting all of his anointed, um, his chosen. And now it says he's bringing that conclusion out in verse 43. And he brought forth his people with joy and his chosen with gladness. This, these are the people that he had chosen. Verse 44, and gave them the lands of the heathen. The thing that they were promised, they received. And they inherited the labor of the people. Why? That they might observe his statutes and keep his laws. Praise ye the Lord. You see, when we see God working, we shouldn't expect that, that it's only God working when things are going, you know, well, and I'm happy, and it's the devil working when I'm, un- I'm unhappy. Sure, the devil's at work, but God is working in all of it. He's controlling all of it. And he steps in, and he stops things that don't need to happen to, to make sure that everything's going exactly according to plan. So God's allowed everything in our world today. You see it, you say, that's bad. Yes, it's a bad thing, but God allowed it, right? And that's because he's got a plan, he's got a purpose. He's still working. He's still at work, Right? So we see God working, and we say, okay, God has a purpose and a plan that he's accomplishing. What should we do as a result? And this loops us back. Verse 45 ends with the phrase, praise you the Lord, and it kind of loops us back to the beginning of the whole psalm. Look at the beginning of the psalm. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him. Sing psalms unto him. Talk ye of his wondrous works. Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them that rejoice seek the Lord. You see, the number one, you know, the, the whole thing is praising God. That's what it should result in our mouths. It should result in our lives, praise to God. But there's two aspects of that. The first one is praising in front of other people. Singing unto him, singing psalms, talking of his wondrous works and, and, and of his deeds. Glory in his holy name. That means like, you know, instead of being a downer, you know, you're going around saying, look, God is working. God is doing something, talking of his wondrous deeds. That's not just, by the way, with, with brethren here on Sunday, which is, by the way, my favorite part about Sunday, because I don't get to sit and listen to the sermon. <laughs> but I love to sit around and talk about the things God is doing and talk about the Lord after the service and before during Sunday school. And that's what I like. And, and that's wonderful. But I think this is more than that, right? 
This is praising God even beyond the walls of the church. This is praising God to people who think you're crazy. But you're like, no, I'm not crazy. Look at what he's doing. Look at all of his wondrous works. Look at what he's done in the past. Look at what he's doing right now. God is at work. But there's more to praising God than just telling other people about it. And notice this. Verse 4, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face forevermore. Remember his marvelous works which he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. It seems like this is more, instead of just talking to others about it, now we're turning in more of an inward sense and we're seeking God for ourselves in more of a private way here. The first two verses are very public, and then verse 3 transitions. Glory in his holy name, let the heart, now we're talking inward, of them rejoice that seek the Lord. This is a personal seeking of God within our own hearts. You see, as we're looking around, instead of you know, seeing all the bad things that are happening, we're saying, God is doing something. God is working in my life. God is working in my, my country, in, in, you know, in my neighborhood, whatever it is. God is doing something here. And I'm seeing that he's accomplishing his promises. And now that I'm looking at it through the lens of God's at work and he's accomplishing something, now I can go back and I can say, wow, this is good. I can start praising him, not just in front of others, but I can seek God personally in my own heart and say, Lord, thank you. Like praise him privately as well as publicly. You know, sometimes we get the habit in prayer of just, you know, this list. God, please do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Instead of, Lord, all the things that you've said no to or that you, I haven't seen an answer yet for, thank you for, for not giving me an answer because of your promises and your plan and your purpose, right? Thank you for saying no to whatever this was. I don't understand it. I, I, I certainly don't feel very grateful for it, but I know that you are working a plan and a purpose, and I'm going to praise you for that. And you see how this passage then is so rich in real, genuine meaning. But it can be robbed from us by making it all about, you know, submitting to a pastor even if he's doing wrong. That's nonsense. Don't do that. And, and, and let's say for a rule going forward that when we have something that seems correct from one verse of Scripture, we're just going to read the whole chapter just to see if that's really what it says. <laughs> because... You see, now that we've pulled that curtain back, we can see that God has a very powerful, real truth for us to know from Psalm 105. And that is that God does rebuke kings for his anointed. But the anointed in this passage would be all of God's people. If you want to apply that to us, that would be not the pastor, but all of his people. And God does stop some things from happening, some things that you may have no idea might have happened, God's already prevented them from happening. He's already protected us from. I mean, just just think about it, right? I mean, just how God has orchestrated the course of history so that for the last 250 years almost, America has been a safe haven for Christianity. You say, well, it's going away, but look at where we are right now. At least we've had it for 250 years, right? Just think about how God has provided for us. All the things that God has allowed and God has caused, and I think it should cause us to turn instead of groping and and whining and complaining, yes, there's lots to pray about, but rather there's also lots to praise about. Let's be people with God's praise on our lips. Father in heaven, I thank you for the truth of your word. I pray that you would help us to be faithful to the teachings of the scriptures. Not not to the, the, the ideas that somebody comes up with, but to the truths of your word. The fact that that when you're working, it doesn't always feel like you're working. But you are always at work. You never sleep, you never slumber. You are accomplishing a work in this world. You're accomplishing a work in my life, in my heart. And God, forgive me for so often skipping the praise part. 
This should all cause us to sing your praises with our voices, with our lips, to others and to you in private, in our personal lives. I pray that you'd help us to do that. Help us to be people who are filled with your praise. We pray these things in Jesus' name.